my 9 4 by 5 o'clock by this one. So, I will start again. This will show you ladies. Are you scared of taking medicine? And only one sip of water. <clears throat> good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and good evening, my super girls. I'm so happy to be here uh, addressing you people. I've been a border myself. Um, this was not a uh, well, little bit of drama, but uh, I have to take these medicines twice a day. They are called immunosuppressants, and they keep uh, my body from rejecting my heart. And this is how to proceed to my story. Uh, I am, uh, besides the introduction, uh, I had a heart attack in uh, 2015. I was 42, I was like football. I was also football captain uh, in Cynthia School and uh, was wanting to play for the country, never made it. But at 42, I was playing for clubs. And uh, one fine day, I had something called uh, sudden cardiac death which uh, is quite prevalent these days. You must have heard of people running marathons or people in the gym suddenly collapsing, having a heart attack. Um, I had one of those. Uh, it's, it's a silent heart attack. It doesn't give you a, a, a very major uh, symptom. Uh, the only thing which was happening to me was a pain in my solar plexus. So I continued to play the match, uh, did a hand trick, um, was the man of the match, and this was a very funny format. It was a six people format in a cage, so the ball never stopped. Uh, the ball was continuously uh, went home, uh, told my wife uh, I had very bad acidity today. Uh, so let me take some antacid. I took an antacid, nothing worked. Uh, then my wife saw my face, I was literally kneeling down with pain and she said, Can I said, pick the uh, So she said, show me and I said, here. And she said, uh, do you think it's for heart? And I literally got up like this, are you mad? Me and uh, my heart? I mean, seriously, soccer player, Tom Smoker, non -drinker. I mean, And if we knew I was having a heart attack, I actually lived three uh, houses away from Max Hospital, then we could have literally walked to Max Hospital. But since there were no symptoms, we continued, she says, okay, since you're in so much pain, let's just go to a doctor and, you know, we put the kids in the car and we brought the kids to Nani house and we went to a nursing home, you know, 45 minutes. During the car journey, I told my wife, you know, something is up, I'm getting cold sweat and I'm losing consciousness. Let's just make it. So, in the, and my my wife is a fantastic driver, but we did have two accidents in the way. And I said, oh, Margaret, all those guys will come and stop us. I literally had to roll down one window and said, I'm having a heart attack. <laughs> anyway, we, we reached the hospital and uh, funnily, the only way to check whether you're having a heart attack uh, or not is to do an ECG. And ECG is a very rudely uh, a device, rudimentary device, uh, and I think I like, appeal to the medical fraternity to get something better and faster. Anyways, by the time they put those things in me, uh, you know, there was severe reaction. I was vomiting with pain by then. So they couldn't get the ECG. They only realized I was getting a heart attack and I was having heart attack is when I flatlined. Uh, so they suddenly realized there's no, there's no heartbeat. And they rushed me to the ICU. And uh, I was lucky enough to have reached the hospital and then flatline. Normally in these cases, 90% uh, of the people are unable to reach the hospital. Uh, and when they are it, uh, it's too late to revive them because the, when the brain is deprived of oxygen for more than a certain period of time, you can never revive it. The heart you can always revive even after four hours. That's how a heart transplant takes place. So, they were able to revive me, told my wife that we are a small nursing home, we cannot handle something like this. I will explain what happens in this kind of a situation. 
a blood clot grows and uh, gets stuck in the iota. Iota is the biggest artery in your heart. So when you and it's a single artery which feeds on the other arteries, so that gets blocked, and the uh, the heart is deprived of oxygen. So what a young heart or a sport, you know, fit heart does is it starts beating hard, really hard. It starts beating harder, and it goes into something called a ventricular tachycardia. That means the heart rate goes up, goes up, goes up to around 300, 320. For all you guys who don't know, resting heart rate is around 75. If you're running a marathon, it should be around 150. But in this case, because the young heart, it goes above 350, and then it completely collapses. That is why it's called sudden cardiac death through a ventricular tachycardia. So they said, you know, we've gotten an uh, ambulance from escorts, we can't handle this. And uh, when they, they put me in the, in the ambulance, my wife was with the driver. And, uh, I had eight more heart attacks in the ambulance. So the symptoms were there. They used to revive me. A heart attack used to happen again. I passed away, not out, away again. They used to revive me again. So uh, I can boast of having died nine times and come back to life, which is also the theme of Overhang today. And I'm here to tell you that um, you know challenges are going to be there in every life, no matter what status you're in, no matter what physical condition you're in, no matter who you are, you'll be faced by challenges. But how you perceive these challenges and how you come out of them is what being a boomerang or what being alive is all about. Right? So anyways, coming back to my story, reached the hospital, they put a stent in the iota, and I was in the hospital for about 15 days, and they said, okay, everything's okay, you had a heart attack, which is fine, you live a near normal life like a, like a heart patient, and you, they released me. Mm. Two months later, I didn't feel great progress. I mean, I went back to uh, starting to walk as per doctor prescription. They said start walking 10 minutes, then we'll start walking 20 minutes. I tried all of that. Nothing happened. Um, they went and met the doctor. They weighed me. They said they have to put a little bit of a device in you, which I still have. I don't know if you guys can see it. It's an ICD. It's not connected. What happens is when the heart is too weak, uh, they put this internal uh, defibrillator, internal cardio defibrillator. So that in case I have another heart attack, this uh, device can give these micro shocks to remove my ventricular tachycardia and I have enough time to reach the hospital. So it, it has an alarm system in it. So basically, if the alarm goes off, I have to rush to the hospital. Luckily, I had one alarm, but that was a false alarm. Uh, something happened. But this was my life for the next six months. I still tried, didn't get better. Um, so six months after my heart attack, they diagnosed me with something called congestive heart failure. Basically what had happened was I had so many episodes and so many heart attacks, they would shock me so much. There was lots of dead muscle in the heart. And the heart uh, was not able to pump the blood out enough into the organs. So the organs were being deprived of oxygen, so it's called congestive heart failure. Shock number two, I thought everything was okay. Uh, you know, and then they say, and I asked the doctor, that, you know, how long will this heart last? So they said, maybe six months. So I said, if I don't get a heart in six months, what happens? He says, you, you need to get a heart in six months. Or they have something called a, a, a pump, left ventricular assist device, which is basically an artificial heart, a pump, but it has a battery pack. You know, it has to be powered, so there are two tubes coming out. I constantly have to wear a battery bag, and the doctor said it's more complicated than a heart transplant. So we prefer if you have a heart transplant. In 2015-2016, I, coming from Sindhya School, engineer, MBA, all the education, but didn't know what a heart transplant was. I had not heard of it. Um, Delhi being, the, being Delhi, escorts had done no transplants. In Kangana, we had done no transplants. Ames had done two transplants. We didn't know whether they were heart or not, and Sauthijan had done two. 
managed to reach Chennai, where one hospital was doing about 10 to 12 transplants a month versus only two to 12. Anyways, we go to Chennai, another funny thing happened. The doctor said, okay, we need to do some tests to, to understand how severe your uh, CHD is, congestive heart failure, CHF is. Um, so they put you, the first test is a preliminary test, they put they put a VO2 max, it's called a VO2 max, they put it, uh, an oxygen uh, mask on your face, they do it to a lot of sportsmen. And they either make you run or they put you on a bike. So they put me on the stationary bike and they said, okay, start cycling. So I started cycling. This was six months since I played soccer, so I was relatively fit. So what, 15 minutes of doing this, he said, okay, you're done. And uh, the doctor said, you're borderline. Maybe you don't need a heart transplant. And I said, what the hell is happening? I've come all the way to Chennai, you say, heart, you're not going to die again, you're not going to die again, what's happening? And the second test is a more conclusive test where they put uh, they put a camera into your mouth and they put some stuff through you and see how your heart is beating and they put some medicine to see how the heart reacts to that medicine. It's supposed to be a two hour of, uh, procedure and within 40 minutes they said, yeah, you definitely need a, need a heart transplant. And they said, don't go back, you stay here, we put you on a list, uh, the government has a list it's a NOCO National Registry for Organ Transplantation. You said, I said, no, but I have to go and settle that. Said, they said, when can you come back? I said, when you please give me five days. I said, okay, come back in five days. So anyways, we did all of that. And uh, we moved to Chennai, my wife and I, my kids were living with my in-laws. And this is with the darkest period of my lifestyle. My, Till now, the darkest period had not started. I died and come back. I had been given a life ultimatum again. But now the waiting period was the most difficult period of my life. I had to wait for about four or five months. And, uh, you know, I didn't know where they were going. I didn't know whether I was going to get a heart. I didn't know when my current heart was going to collapse. Let me give you an example. Two months before my heart transplant, my my heart was so weak. Uh, there is something called an EF, ejection fracture, left ventricular ejection fracture. For normal people, it's the efficiency by which the heart pumps out the blood. For normal people, it's between 45 to 75. Sportsmen have it a little bit above 75. Uh, below 20 is critical. My EF was, uh, according to the doctors, about 10 because the, the, the machines cannot measure. Uh, below 20. Uh, to give you an example, I could not get up and walk to the washroom without uh, having to hold myself and take my breath. I was not able to uh, wipe myself with a towel without having to sit and take my breath back. Uh, I could not sleep uh, supine because the pressure of my uh, chest, my, my lungs was so uh, stressful to my heart, my heart couldn't, couldn't breathe, so I had to sit up and sleep. And I was on a wheelchair, and I was on a intravenous medicine 24-7. And I, my weight was maybe half of this, I don't remember. But it was very weak, in fact, I told you know, you're flying back to Delhi, and I had to wait for the wheelchair. So when you're in a flight and you're waiting for the wheelchair, everybody has to first exit. And the wheelchair person comes and then picks you up and puts you in. And everybody was giving these weird looks. And I literally told my wife, like, you know, I don't want to live a life like this. It's, a, it's not a life I want to live. Anyway, um, one day uh, we get a call in Chennai that have you had anything to eat morning? So we said we had breakfast. They said, okay. Uh, don't eat anything, which means that they found a potential heart. Now uh, there is a sad story behind the heart transplant as well. The sad story is that typical heart donor, we call, is a cadaver donor donation, which means that somebody has to pass away in order to donate the heart. So in typical cases, you have accident victims who are uh, declared brain dead. 
and when they're switching off the life support system is when they harvest the organs. So when I got this call, I was happy, but I was extremely sad as well because this is this is a, a lot lot of uh, transplant survivors go through this. I mean, am I am I giving his life? He gave up his life to give me life. And this was a twenty six year old heart. Uh, when I came to know, it was even it, you know I, I didn't feel good at all. But anyways, my survival instincts kicked in, and uh, uh, I was wheeled in, and uh, there was a, it was a successful heart transplant in Chennai. Uh, woke up. Um, uh, so normally the there's a package for 15 days in the ICU. I was out of the ICU in four days. Uh, I started my physiotherapy in a week. I was climbing one, uh, one, uh, one whole floor of stairs up and down by then. And they were in fact nurses who, you know, nurses had to change of duties. New nurses were coming in and saying, oh, so you're the footballer. <laughs> so I said, why are you calling me a footballer? Because they said, uh, you know, your recovery has been so, so fast. Another sad, uh, Statistic was that in that month, uh, Fortis Malan in Chennai did 15 uh, transplants. I don't know how many heart they did, out of which five tra heart transplants were uh, child children, I mean, below 10. Um, they bounce back, they're fantastic. They bounce back like that. All the five uh, 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 toddler transplants were successful. Out of the 10, I was the only one who walked out of the hospital that night. So, uh, beating all odds, um, we did the whole thing. Um, came back to Delhi, um, and um, one of my best friends uh, who knew me from school, uh, I have to mention his name, Vivek Talwar, Vicky Talwar, he's a golfer. In fact, uh, when I was in the hospital, uh, during my heart attack, my wife called him, and he was at uh, some place almost close to. <laughs> Uh, Jaipur, it's ITC. Uh, he was playing golf. He left and he came and rushed and to meet me. Of course, he couldn't meet me. He, uh, when he met me, he said, "Okay, Karan, I know you. You are a sportsman. You've always been a sportsman, and you're not going to survive without playing a sport. So here is my driver and here is my putter. We have to hold a driver and a putter, two clubs out of a golf club." And he said. Please keep this with you. Whenever you are up to it, you start golf. Golf is something that you can play till you're 100 years old. Uh, it's not going to affect you at all. And uh, please. And he followed up, being the friend that he was. So it took me six months to recovery. The recovery was also complicated. Uh, I have a dog in the house. First, the doctor said, keep the dog out. I said, how can I keep the dog out? It's my child. They said, okay, then you time out outside the house. They said, there's no way I'm time outside the house. They said, okay, he can't be on the same floor. I said, nothing to it. I'm not going to stop him. What has he done wrong? They said, okay, Baba, at least don't let him enter your room for six months. I said, okay, that can be done. So, um, bounce back. Thanks to modern medication today, uh, I am, it is, I don't call myself uh, a sick man. I'm not considered a sick man. In fact, I don't have any cardio, cardiac issues. I have had a transplant. I am uh, susceptible to, to cardiovascular issues, but I have to manage my disease. I manage it. Just the way somebody with diabetes or blood pressure manages their disease. This is how I perceive it. Right? I can very easily say, yeah, there is no heart transplant. No, no, no point. I have a few days left to live. I'm going to live to the maximum. So let me tell you how my day is made. And this is this is how you perceive challenges. I have the same stress. I I fight with my siblings, I fight with my wife, I fight with my partners, I fight with my clients, I have issues in my business, I have cash flow, bank is on my head, I am in debt, everything. But I'm alive now. Huh? If I can open my eyes 
and get out of my bed and stand up straight. My day sorted. What else do you need? You're alive. I mean, take care. Barish ho rahi hai bhaar ko main bhaar nahi ja sakta. Come on, stupid things, right? I uh, mean, exams. I was telling somebody, it's it's not the end of life. You should perceive your exams as deadlines. It's it's only a deadline for you. Whether you complete it, you do it well, you'll have another deadline. And then you'll have another deadline. And your exams will finish. You'll become a professional. You'll join a corporate. There'll be a deadline again. You know, it's just perceive it like that. I mean, man, I all fail more my engineering, but I will be engineer. But yeah, engineering, karke, I am a, and I run a relatively successful company. So it's it's just a matter of how you perceive yourself. Give me a second. Since this is not scripted, I have to look at the watch. Okay, almost time up. So I'm going to start concluding now. <clears throat> Post transplant. Um, New lease of life. I'm a new man. My perception changed. I woke up and I told myself that, what have you done in life? What has been your achievement? I mean, can you point to something which you are really, really proud of that you have done? I couldn't find anything. And this is 42, 43. It is important to find your purpose, and that's when I found my purpose. My purpose is. To create organ donation awareness all over the country and all over the world, and I work with a lot of NGOs to do this. Um, you will be surprised to know that one person who decides to donate their organs can have a potential to save between six to eight lives. If you are donate organ donate, karte ho, if you are lucky enough to be able to. Donate your organs. You can save between six to eight lives. Imagine that. Imagine that power. Bhagwan hota hai jo zindagi deta hai. Mera ek bhagwan hai. Unfortunately, I did not meet him. I I don't see his face. The laws in India are, are very strict. They don't allow you to meet your donor. But my rose to be with me every morning when I wake up. I pray to that nameless person, faceless person who gave me life. This is one thing. You have to, have to, have to understand. Be grateful. Just be grateful, and your day will be sorted. Second thing I want to tell you is by agreeing and convincing your family, your parents, your grandparents. There is no age limit to donating organs. By agreeing to uh, convincing your dear ones to donate organs, there is no better sacrifice that you can do. So please go home today. Think about what I have said. Think about how many lives you can save, and convince your parents and your peers to sign up for organ donation. It's very simple. Lastly, I will tell you, this is not for your age group. Maybe when you grow up a little bit older, uh, maybe for your parents and your grandparents, uh, the legacy that you leave behind is should not be your will or. Or the success should not be your financial success. It's how many lives you were able to save. Those people will still be living after you have gone. That should be the legacy that you leave behind, not your will. With that, I will.